60 days in. 60 days in. Now, what is an appropriate sanction? The question is, I can sentence him up to 180 days without trial. Or I can sentence him. You know what I think the answer is? 60 days in. I want an independent individual to scour that household to determine that there's no further weapons. I find that Mr. Erdl's original argument that he's trying to make that I sustain, an officer, an officer of the law, every time I go into court, I hear, I didn't know it was there, I didn't know it was there, it really didn't. You've heard that a million times. You've heard it a million times, and yet you still take them into custody for being like this. Every officer in the world has heard, I didn't know it was there, it's my friends. Hey guys, for public safety with you, um, for another video. This one is uh, back to the Clark County, Indiana courthouse because if you remember, the sheriff that we here at for public safety busted in a criminal syndicate, a government ran criminal syndicate. He has been charged with contempt uh, and there's more than that. So join us, we're gonna go to court see what they do about all this. They found more guns. They found more guns. They found more guns. Uh, so I hear from my uh, little birdies that there is currently a forensics team at Jamie Dahl's house on uh, doing an investigation on him here, or on his investigation. So we are, are we pulling in the right spot? Yeah. We are going to see for ourselves. And, um, yep, it's happening. <laughs> the Indiana State Police is here. And they are doing, It look, I was told it's forensics. So, we're here. You better get up there if you want the, maybe it's not. You're here. No, it's not. We're here. It's not very often you actually see them uh, looking into, you know, one of their own. <laughs> uh, put a one in the chat if you think this guy's, if, if you think this whole thing might be a bit political. Two in the chat if you think it's just flat out, they caught him, busted him. And I, I mean, I know he's been breaking the law, but um, put a one in the chat if you think it might be political as well. He says they're looking for clothing. Nice to meet you too. We'd run for public safety YouTube page and uh, have done a lot of work on this whole thing. This sheriff has actually uh, caused us to start our channel. It did us wrong uh, two years ago. So we started investigating them and I actually reported a lot of the stuff that they're looking into. So um, there's been kind of a team of us working together to uh, report everything and publish everything that's been going on um, over the past two years. It's collectively, we've ran it by each other. 
you know, we've dug around, got information, um, verified information, you know, published information that we've verified. And it's been a whole team, everything from political um, to government to uh, journalists. If you're aware of the uh, channel that I have um, supported and boosted on my channel called uh, Citizens in Action, Clark County, make sure you guys subscribe to that channel because they're one of the groups that I work with and have been working with um, to uncover some of this corruption. The former Sheriff Jamie Knowles house and they are uh, forensics is doing an investigation and I'm told it's over some type of expensive clothing, which, you know, I'm, I'm glad that they're kind of reaching and getting everything that they can, but there's been other stuff. How you doing, buddy? Is there somebody that's in like a lead position that I could report something else to? Report something else to? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, so now uh, something to take note is that the ISP that's doing this investigation is not the local. This is not Post 45. Thank As you. a matter of fact, right? As a matter of fact, um, they would have already found no wrongdoing. Oh, they would. They did. That, that was the problem. They oh, were finding yeah. no wrongdoing and everything and uh, refusing to take reports. You need Watch to do your, your job. South building and I am not leaving. Do your job, Mabel. Touch me and what I do you will want? Do your job. What do you want? We need to make a report. You're going to do a report. Other police officers breaking the law. Sir, what's your name and badge number? No, no, no. Don't close that window. What's your name and badge number? You just oh, smashed you your just fingers. Smashed his fingers. Good job, dumbass. At a boy. Don't open that window. Why not? I need to do business here. This is my place. This is where, I, hey, look, this is mine. Sir, do not open this. This window. is my place. You open that window. We were trying to report this stuff, and there's more to it that hadn't come out yet, and I believe that what we were trying to report that day exactly, the thing that you know about, that because uh, we didn't get around to doing a full report, uh, they wouldn't let us at ISP 45. So um, we didn't even get to say everything. But what you did hear us talking about, that will probably end up getting busted out in this investigation that they are doing uh, because it's tied to the Genco. You guys know what Genco was for them? <laughs> and and what Genco is to them? <laughs> Here, I'll go ahead and put it like this. Genco <clears throat> was a uh, money laundering scheme on the movie The Godfather 2. Uh, and that is the name that Jamie gave his uh, money laundering scheme here was Genco. Genco ties back to a lot of different uh, local companies, if you will. And one of the companies that was on the Genco payroll was what we were trying to report at ISP at that time. So that's kind of a big deal. Hopefully it comes out in this. There's been a lot happening with this uh, case. So, you know, I hope that the public doesn't lose interest in all these different elements because it'll be uh, really interesting when it all ties back together at the end of the entire investigation. And I also wonder how long it's going to take. Well. Now, uh, this is good information. Jamie's daughter, Casey Noel, who ran for council in Utica, on this last term. Uh, thankfully, she didn't win. This is Utica where we're at, and Utica's where the money's been being stolen from and the equipment's been being stolen from the military in Utica, all this kind of stuff. Um, Casey was arrested the other day. Did you guys know that? Casey was arrested on nine charges. The former Clark County, Indiana Sheriff's daughter now in jail, arrested and charged with nine felonies of her own. Now, five of the charges are for alleged theft and four of them are for alleged tax evasion. She's accused of charging nearly $100,000 worth of personal items to the Utica Township Volunteer Firefighters Association credit cards. Those items charged up on the card include clothing, Netflix, tanning and more. She then failed to report those charges as personal income on her taxes. Same thing as her daddy. Um, and they were trying to keep the criminal empire uh, actively in charge by putting their people in council positions and stuff like that. That's been kind of the thing that they've done all along, that sort of stuff. But yeah, she was arrested on a warrant um, just the other day and charged. So now Jamie's been arrested and out on bond. Misty's been arrested. That's his wife. She's been arrested and out on bond.
The wife of former Clark County Sheriff Jamie Knoll entering the courtroom in handcuffs. Prosecutors allege the couple used credit cards to steal hundreds of thousands of dollars from the Utica Township Fire Association. They're also accused of cheating on their taxes. Misty Knoll's attorney asked the court for bond and release from jail. The special prosecutor countered by calling Mrs. Knoll a flight risk. I point to the numerous homes located here in Clark County and also a home in uh, the state of Florida. But Misty Knoll's attorney pointed out that his client is a nurse and a lifelong resident of the area. Judge, she is no flight risk. She is no risk of not appearing in court. She is employed and has been employed, wants to go back to work. She served this community and she's an asset to this community. After both sides had their say, Judge Larry Medlock ordered Misty Knoll released from custody on a $30,000 cash bond and required Mrs. Knoll to surrender her passport. Jamie Knoll, the former sheriff, is now charged with 25 felonies related to public corruption, misconduct, theft, and fraud. Misty Knoll is charged with 10 felonies. The special prosecutor assigned to the case says there may be more to come. This is an ongoing investigation. It's very fluid and things can change by the day or the week as the state receives additional information. The problem that I have is that they have caught other people like Kenneth Hubanks, uh, former, very short term former Scott County Sheriff, whose wife is the county council president. Uh, they caught him in arranging the $262,000, uh, well they busted him for, for stealing $262,000. This time the focus is on another former sheriff, the former Scott County Indiana Sheriff Kenny Hubanks. Hubanks is not charged but he's accused of receiving taxpayer money to his private business and not declaring it on his taxes. Focus reporter Travis Breeze tells us what we know about the alleged scheme. This is Kenny Hubanks speaking to WHAS 11 in 2018 while he was still Scott County Sheriff. In search warrants, state investigators say he had a multi-year profitable relationship with Jamie Knoll. Noel personally approved roughly $280,000 out of the jail commissary fund to pay Hubanks Enterprises for consulting work. The state says the LLC has never filed an income tax return. That could be legal if Hubanks and his wife had declared the income on their own joint taxes, but state investigators say that did not happen. Investigators also interviewed a Clark County Sheriff's employee who says Hubanks refused to fill out a 1099 form because he would be required to pay taxes. The same employee brought this up to Sheriff Jamie Knoll, who told her not to give Hubanks the tax form. Hubanks was also an on and off employee for the Clark County Sheriff's Office. In another document, he allegedly watched an employee organize the file room there and instructed inmate workers to remove a stack of boxes labeled commissary. Investigators have been unable to find any commissary records from 2018. And they didn't arrest him. Uh, and they, you know, that to me is a problem. I don't understand why they didn't arrest him and I will ask, but there's been a lot more going on lately. Oh, you found the overpriced clothing, huh? <laughs> Good job, fellas. How you guys doing today? Doing all right, man. A lot better after hearing this was going on today. <laughs> oh, the weather's great. Yeah, you too, man. Be careful. So, Heron is the lead investigator that's uh, been chosen to handle this case from a completely different district um, so that there wouldn't be as much corruption involved or conflict of interest. But when you're talking about you know, an empire that, you know, literally has been supported by uh, governors and even vice presidents, not necessarily being involved in the direct corruption, but being involved in, in Jamie Knoll's life, uh, supportive of Jamie Knoll. Now, Jamie was the uh, Republican Party chair for the state, uh, which he just lost that seat just recently. 
Uh, but it's probably because of all this publicity. That's one of the reasons I kind of look at this and go, I wonder how political um, they're, I wonder if they're digging mostly on a political level, you know, because we're seeing a lot of stuff get slipped through the cracks so far. Um, and I'm very curious as to why. Time to go to court, guys. C01-2403 MC634. Um, while we were in the other room, you know, his legal arguments and potential resolution of the issue. Um, you'll notice that Miss Collada is not here, and with her permission, we are going to commence the uh, rule to show cause hearing. Mr. Herb. How about this? Anybody that's going to testify, please stand, raise your right hand. Anybody. We got everybody? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under the penalties of perjury? The testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. All right. You can have a seat. Call your first witness, Mr. Hurley. Your Honor, before we begin, we'd like to make a separation of witnesses, please. I think that would be appropriate, granted. Except the state may have a representative to set a table. Just, if, we, if we could, just briefly, um, just to make a procedural question, we have, um, and would like to raise the record is, uh, we'd like to to understand and, and make sure that we are here relative to an indirect contempt filing um, on an issue today. And if that is correct, um, we would just ask that the procedures in Indiana Code 34-47-3-7 um, and ask for the appointment of a special judge relative to uh, the requirements for indirect contempt findings in the state of Indiana. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Old Tate Bridge, uh, Daniel Hill's residence. And are you familiar with that residence? I am. Have you been there before? Yes. Mr. Mitchell, I'm showing you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit 1. Would you take a look at State's Exhibit 1? Okay. What is State's Exhibit 1? That's 3001 Old Tate Bridge. Jamie is Hill's it, residence. Is that residence. the same address you just were speaking about, about assisting with a search warrant on March 13th? It is. Does that appear to be truly and accurately reflective of the outside of the residence on it, Tabor Ridge? It does. No objection to State's Exhibit 1, Your Honor. So State's Exhibit Number 1 admitted without objection. Your Honor, State moved to admit. Admitted. <clears throat> Detective, were you um, in charge of the uh, search warrant or the scene at Old Tabor Ridge Road on March 13th? I was not. And who were you taking direction from? Lieutenant Jeff Heron with the Indiana State Police. Did you have any contact with the uh, defendant, uh, Jamie Knoll, on that day? I saw him, but I didn't communicate with him. Did you have any conversation at all? I did not. What was your role once you got to Tabor Bridge and you went into the home? To help search. And do you recall what you were searching for? Uh, we were searching for uh, Tom James suits and apparel, shoes, belts. Were you searching for anything else with respect to Tom James clothing? Any receipts or documents associated with uh, those uh, items. Were you provided any type of lists of apparel items or things that you were specifically looking for? I was. Uh, who provided that to you? Lieutenant Jeff Heron. Was that prior to the search or uh, once you got to Tate Bridge? Once we got to the location. How was it decided where you were going to be searching specifically yourself? Uh, we just kind of communicated upstairs once the scene was secured and I volunteered to go downstairs and start in the basement. 
Can you describe the, uh, the basement uh, to the judge? Your Honor, when you walk down into the basement, um, it opens up into a large uh, living room type area, family room. Uh, there's another door that you, if you continue down the stairs, it goes into a back room, which is a movie theater area. And then I centered my, uh, focused my search to the left uh, when you walked into the back room, which was a table area where there was some Tom James suits and apparel. Was the basement a finished basement or a, uh, a concrete basement? Well, it was finished with the exception of one part, which was kind of storage with shelves in there. Was there any, were there any living areas in the, uh, the basement? I do believe there was at least one bedroom downstairs. Did you go to the basement alone or with any other uh, troopers and or other state police employees? I don't remember if I was down there alone at any one given time, and I don't remember who went with me. There were various people that came down with me during the search. Detective, I'm showing you what's been marked for identification purposes. States exhibits two, three, and four. Do you recognize states two, three, and four? I do. What are they? Uh, these are pictures of the area. Um, when you come down the stairs and go into the back room to the left, this is the table and the area of the, where I focused my initial search in the basement. So two, three, and four are a basement area? Correct. Okay. Why did you go to this specific area? Were you searching uh, for something specific there? Well, when I first got to the residence, Mr. No took uh, Lieutenant Heron downstairs. I followed, and he was showing Lieutenant Heron where the areas are located, or areas in the house where there were Tom James suits and apparel, and that was one of the areas that he pointed out, and I was present when that happened. And that's why I focused my search down there, not to mention you could also see um, some uh, containers, uh, little shopping bags that contained, that were John or Tom, uh, uh, James apparel bags. So that's why I focused my search there. Did the defendant specifically show you and Detective Heron this location? He did. Do those truly and accurately reflect the, uh, the area in the basement where he directed you to? It does. Your Honor, we do not have any objections to State's Exhibit 2, 3, and 4. State would move to admit State's three, 2, 3, and 4, Your Honor. State's Exhibits 2, 3, and 4 admitted without objection. Your Honor, if I can use these with the you witness. Uh, I want to direct your attention to State's Exhibit 2, Detective. Um, did you take the photograph? I did not. But does it truly and accurately reflect uh, what you saw there? It does. Okay. I want to direct your attention specifically to a, a black object sticking um, out of a box. Okay. Did you see this object when you were conducting your search? I did. What is it? It's a shotgun. Okay. Was that shotgun examined in any way, shape, or form? It was. I looked to see if it was loaded. Okay. And how, why did you do that? Well, I mean, you know, I'm in that area searching and firearms are dangerous. <clears throat> Uh, did that cause you any kind of concern that there was a, uh, a shotgun there? It did not. Okay. Now, the uh, states three and four, these two photographs focus on a white box with a black box inside of those. Yeah. Do you recognize those as well? I do. And is that how they look when you saw them? They do. Okay. Did you look inside of that large white box? I did. Okay, for what purpose? Uh, we're looking for uh, any receipts, documents, belts, and other apparel. Okay. Did anything cause you any type of concern in that box? Well, when I moved the chair out, inside that box was two Smith & Wesson boxes, which Smith & Wesson is a firearm. And that's something you're familiar with, being a police officer for uh, nearly 30 years? I am. Smith & Wesson is a brand? It is. Okay. Uh, did you examine the contents of the box? I did. 
And what was inside the box? Uh, two firearms, yeah. handguns. Did they appear to be loaded? I don't believe they were. Okay. Once you noticed these um, two firearms, what did you do? I notified uh, Detective Chris Hansen and Lieutenant uh, Jeff Heron. And just for the record purposes, um, Detective, you're talking about in State's Exhibit 2, the center of the picture, white box, black box, and the inside of it with a, you can at least see it says Smith on it? Yes. Okay. And then in State's Exhibit 3, you're talking about the white box on the chair? Yes. Okay. Why did you notify uh, Detective Heron once you uh, located uh, these two firearms? Well, it was my responsibility to let him know, having been here for the initial hearing and hear the judge um, order the defendant to only possess a shotgun. When I found the firearms, it's my responsibility to notify uh, the lead detective, Lieutenant Jeff Heron, mm -hmm. and I did. Obviously, those two Smith & Wesson were not shotguns. They were not. You saw a shotgun there and it didn't cause you any concern other than to make sure it was unloaded. Correct. You, were, you stated that you were here for a initial hearing with uh, this particular defendant, with this particular judge. I was. Were you present when he was, um, I guess, told what he could keep and what he couldn't keep? Yes. Is that why you contacted Detective Heron? It was. Did you physically take these guns into your possession at the time? I did not. Okay. Ultimately, did the Indiana State Police take them into their possession? They did. Detective, um, states two, three, and four that Mr. Wilder. Uh, Mr. Wilder, two. Oh. Yes. States two, three, and four. Um, the chair was partially pushed under a table at the time, or all the way under the table? I believe it was all the way under the table. Okay. The items that were located on top of the table, did you examine any of those items? I did. What, what were some of those items? Uh, there were, um, what, I, what I recall mainly was a cowboy hat and uh, cowboy uh, western footwear, boots. Did they appear to be men's, women's, or you couldn't tell? Uh, I think men's. And this is the uh, area that uh, the defendant directed you, Detective Heron, to? Correct. Did you find any Tom James apparel, suits, belts, shoes or anything like that in that particular area as well? I did. Uh, Your Honor, I don't have any other questions for Detective Mitchell. Cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon, Detective. I want to talk to you a little bit about your role. Uh, you got on March 13th, you were asked to uh, get a search warrant together, is that it? I did. Okay. And when you do that, how do you do that? You call somebody? I was called uh, by Lieutenant Jeff Heron okay. sometime that morning. He told me he was going to be executing a search warrant and asked me that if I would uh, get a couple troopers and a couple detectives. How and many troopers did you go into that house with? Uh, two troopers. And how many detectives? I believe four. Okay, so you got six people plus yourself. Well, there was a crime scene technician as well, and I believe there was that's someone seven. there. That's Pardon me? That's seven. Who okay. else? There would have been someone there from um, State Board of Accounts as well. Okay. Uh, do you normally, when you execute a search warrant, you bring somebody from the State Board of Accounts? Uh, not in any of the cases that I've worked. Um, not in all the 29 years you've worked at the... State Police, have you ever taken anybody from the State Board of Accounts in on a search warrant? Not me personally, but this isn't the first time that someone's from State Board of Accounts has been Okay, there. but there's at least seven to eight people going into that house, correct? Correct. Now, who was in charge of that search? You? Lieutenant Jeff Heron. Okay, so Lieutenant Heron's the one giving the orders. Correct. Is it, and that's how it works in the, your office? That is correct. Okay, and when Lieutenant Heron he would have assigned, because it's a large house, isn't it? It is. Okay, how many rooms? I do, I do not know. More than 10? Yes. Okay. Finished, unfinished? Most of it was finished with the exception of the basement area where the dogs were at. Okay. And what you had for the request of the search warrant were for clothing, is that correct? 
clothing and documents and receipts associated with those clothing. Okay. Well, I noticed in the return of the search warrant, there isn't anything listed where you got any of this material. In other words, let me look you and see if you could refresh your recollection and tell me on item uh, 2000, where'd you get it? I didn't fill out this. I didn't collect any clothing. I didn't well, fill this out. Well, let me understand something. You you got all these people in there to search a house, correct? Right. Lieutenant Heron is in charge, okay? And you go to a closet to get something. Don't you document where you got it, how you got it? Take a picture of it? Yes. Okay. Can you tell me from that return? Tell the court what a return is. A return is a document that's completed by law enforcement after they execute a search warrant to notify the court of what items were taken during that search. Does it also supposed to indicate to the court where they came from? Uh, I do not. In my 29 years, I don't, I don't believe so. If you've it is, never put if it on, is, you've educated me today. Okay. You, you've never put on anything uh, in a search warrant where it came from. I on, can, a, it, on a search warrant or search warrant return? Return. Sorry. On a search warrant return, I would, I've never put anything in there about where something was recovered from. So it's up to the court to, or anybody, we have to guess. I wonder well, where you got that. Well, from that document, you would, but there's a police report that should identify then where those but, items were but, found. But I'm only looking at what you file with the court, the return. Okay. So the court doesn't have any idea where you got any of this stuff, does it? With that document? Yes, sir. With the exception of 3001 Otay Bridge, you're correct. Okay. And that is true for every item that you seize that day. There's no indication where it came from. Well, I mean, I can look at it again, but sure. I didn't complete okay. that document and I didn't seize any evidence. Okay. So but I'm somebody gonna... did. Right. And somebody's required to fill out a return that says, A, where they got it, what it was. Is that correct? So this document that you have here for me to look at is an Indiana State Police property record receipt form, okay. um, which is uh, where you put the item down that you, you know, you, you give the item, uh, the item and number, okay. and then you give a description of item submitted, which is right here. Right. Um, but you don't give what, any description. That's what these are, but there's nowhere on this form um, for anyone to put, unless you, I guess you could, you could write in that you found this item here, this item there, but this form is for item submitted. Sure. Um, it's, it's like an inventory. Yeah, and it would be helpful to know where you got it, wouldn't it? In a large house with all these items. <coughs> Certainly right. it would be help, helpful, but that's going to be documented in police report. Well, be for me. It would be very helpful to be technical and say exactly where I got something and what it was, correct? Correct. On a police report, that's what would be there. So you've got seven to eight people going through this house. And Lieutenant Heron is the one that directs where you go. Is that correct? Um, I mean, there's discussion in advance like, okay, we've got this house to search. We have a crime scene technician that's going to photograph everything. And then we're going to just kind of communicate and, and uh, go about it in an organized fashion. And I said, I will go to the basement. Very often what you do, don't you, is you go to a location you see a piece of evidence, then the crime scene technician takes a picture of what evidence you found. Is that right? Is that correct? Well, yes, but like in this case, the, the uh, crime scene technician took photos prior to the search. I understand that. Then the search is conducted, item is found, you notify the crime scene technician who comes down and photographs that item and then ultimately collects it. Did he photograph then uh, every item where it was located? Every item that's on that list? Yes. I do not know the answer, sir. Okay. So we don't have a series of pictures that you know about that would document where the clothing was. Correct? Each item of clothing? I uh, can't say that, no. I, I do not know the answer to that. Okay. And uh, what room did you go to and who was with you? I went to the basement um, as depicted in, in the state's exhibit there. State's exhibits. Okay. And uh, I, I don't remember who went with me initially. Um, what was your role? 
just to look for Tom James suits and apparel. I was provided with a list of uh, items um, with serial numbers next to them that was to be compared to the, uh, say for instance, we find a, a box of shoes that came from Tom James. It would have a number on that box and we tried to compare that number to the list that was provided to me by Lieutenant uh, Jeff Heron. Um, and those were the items that he would then want to seize. And you indicated that our client, uh, Mr. Noel, was there and directed you into a particular location, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, take a look at the picture that's up on the screen. Uh, that's our state's exhibit number three. Is this one of the rooms you went into? I guess you could say it is a room. It's a um, it's a downstairs. Is it part of the unfinished part of that house? There, to the right of that, is a um, movie theater. Okay. Um, Which you would say would be a furnished room. I mean, I, I, there's a there's a chair and a table in there that's okay. furnished, so it is furnished. Uh, okay. Uh, the walls look like, I don't recall, but from the photo, the walls look like they're concrete. Was the rest of that area as cluttered as this was? No. Okay. Would you call that a cluttered room? A lot of stuff in there. Correct. I would say, I, I, no, I would not. I would say on top of the table, it's yeah. cluttered, but yeah. not that room. I see pictures hanging on the wall. What about um, all those boxes I see some, there on well, the they, left? They're kind of stacked up. Um, okay. Certainly not as cluttered as what's on the table. Correct. What are the, in the boxes on the left? I don't recall. I believe those are the shoe boxes. Did you go through those? I'm sure I did. Do you don't know? I don't remember. Okay. What's all the stuff underneath it? Uh, don't know. Various items. Okay. And you said that on top of the table it was clothing, shoes, uh, a number of pairs of cowboy boots, a hat, all kinds of things there. Is that correct? I don't believe I said there were clothes, there was clothing items on top of the table. Um, I don't recall if there was clothing items. Certainly there's footwear, uh, there were belts. You don't know what any of this is underneath the hats? No. Okay. Did you go through these boxes? Um, I may have. How about this black box here? What was in that? I, I don't recall. Okay. Let me ask you this. Did you make it an effort in your search to go through every box in that room. Yeah, so ultimately, after I found that firearm, a gentleman from the State Board of Accounts came down at some point, and someone else, I left the area and went upstairs. And okay. they continued to search uh, by comparing the numbers. So the State Board of Accounts is searching now? Everyone's searching, okay. as we've talked about. You don't know how long you were in here? I don't remember. Now, as I understand it, Mr. Noel told you to go in this room, correct? Well, I mean, it's, he didn't really say you need to go in this room. He said there are some items here. Well, he's trying to be helpful to you by saying there may be some items. You've told him what you're looking for, and he's indicating where you could go, correct? Correct. OK. And you indicate that one of the items that you were looking for was in that box. I did not. It just happened to be that you went to that box. I ultimately ended up going to that box as I was searching that area. I pulled that chair out, um, and there this box is that has two boxes in it that say Smith & Wesson, which I'm familiar with as being uh, firearms. Is that the way the box looked on the state's exhibit? Yes. Four. Exhibit four? I believe so. The Okay. All right. And the stuff on the box, or the stuff above the box, was the same kind of stuff that we'd seen at a different angle from State's Exhibit that had been previously shown to you. Yes. Correct. All right. Now, let me ask you, where was Mr. Knoll when you were in that room? I think he had left the residence at that point. Are you sure? Pretty confident he had. Okay. Are you the only one down there when you're searching? Are you the not only through, not through the whole entire event that I was down there searching, no. Okay. All right. 
<coughs> when were the state police searching in that house before? I believe uh, August 16th. Okay. Uh, and what were they looking for then? Um, bank records. Okay. Was the search previously that you were part of? I was part of that search, yes. That was done the same way? In other words, a number of people went through the house looking for all kinds of items? Same thing. I got a call from Lieutenant Jeff Heron said, I need your, your body to assist me in okay. searching. All right. And uh, there were a number of people. And that's what you did? That's correct. Okay. Now, you indicated that what you found in that box, it had nothing on top of the box. It just was there, correct? Just like these other boxes. We're talking the box here. The box the right there. That exhibit that's seeing it. Right. I believe that depicts street. it how it was. Okay. And uh, so is that picture taken before you took the weapons out? After. So you take the box out, get the weapons, and then put the box back so they could take a picture? Yeah, so, Your Honor, uh, going through the search, you know, initially there were photographs taken of the entire scene. Uh, then we conduct a search. And as I'm searching, I pull the chair out and I look down and I see the boxes. I open it up. There's, in fact, a firearm there. Then I went up and notified Lieutenant Jeff Heron of that fact, as well as uh, uh, First Sergeant Merritt Toomey, who's our crime scene guy. We went back down. I pushed the chair back underneath, you know, put the box back. I don't think I took anything out of the box. I think I pulled the chair out, looked, and was like, okay, there's firearms in here and then pushed it back under, notified them, and then he took that photo. My question to you is, does that picture show before the search or after? That picture there, Exhibit 4, I believe is going to be after the dis my discovery. You had already discovered something, showed Lieutenant Heron, brought it back, put it back and re tried to recreate the scene, and then had him take a picture? I'd like to add, I would like to answer that question, but you say I brought it back. What do you refer to by that? Did you bring the box up to Lieutenant No, I did not. Heron? I left it right where it was at. I went and got Lieutenant Jeff Heron, okay. and he came downstairs. And then when you pushed the chair back, that's when you had the photographer take a picture? Correct. Okay. The two boxes that you found inside the large white box, there were weapons in there? They were, yes. Unloaded, I think you testified on I believe they were. Correct? I believe so, yes. Okay. Uh, what was their condition? I think they were brand new. I mean, they appeared to be. They were in, a, they were in their, the box that comes from the manufacturer, it appeared to be. Well, matter of fact, they thought you had a receipt, didn't it? Show when it was purchased. I did not. I'm, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. Did you ever look through that box when you turned it over to Lieutenant Heron to find out when they were purchased? I did not. Okay. You, and you don't recover independently ever seeing a receipt in that box? I don't think so. Okay. What color were those Smith & Wesson boxes? Uh, black and white. Okay. You never took a picture of those out of the box. You no. just left them in the box. In other words, you take them out of the box to photograph them that way. Well, I personally, sir, I never took a photograph. Okay. And you don't know what the technician did? Uh, I, I, I do recall him taking the fo photos of those firearms out of the box when they were laid on the ground after, you know, kind of put it in order. I start my search. I pull it out. I see the firearm. Open one up. There's a firearm. I immediately go upstairs, notify Lieutenant Jeff Aaron. He comes down with me as well as Merit, First Sergeant Merritt Toomey. We put it back like that and the photograph's taken. And then Lieutenant Jeff Heron makes the decision that those firearms are ultimately yeah. potentially going to be seized and they're photographed, taken out of the box. But we don't have that photograph. Uh, the one that you show, or at least testified to, that their guns were taken out of the box, put on the floor, and then photographed. I don't have that photograph with me, sir. Okay, and we haven't seen that yet. Uh, I don't, I, I don't, I've not seen it. Okay. I don't know if we have it or not, but All I right. don't. I'm 
I'm going to get a new technician. I'm fired. <laughs> He's fired. I'm fired. This is for live. Oh, I wouldn't want to do that. Did you not put those in? I, I did not put that oh. in. Oh, okay. Do you want to take a picture of it? No, I'll just have it. Okay. Defendant's exhibit now, uh, and she's given it one. Can you identify what's in that picture? I see uh, two Smith and Wesson uh, firearm uh, boxes, and I see two Smith and what, what appear to be Smith and Wesson firearms uh, with two magazines and two boxes, nine millimeter Luger ammo. Does that refresh your recollection of what you saw that day? I believe so. Okay, thank you. This time, Your Honor, we would offer Defendant's Exhibit 1. No objection, Your Honor. So Defendant's Exhibit Number 1 remitted without objection. May I see you, Mr. Foles? Yes, sir. Thank you. I'll give it right back. You can keep it. Well, thank you. <laughs> Officer, when uh, you took a look at that picture, the two boxes that you previously identified that were inside the larger white box, did you recognize those as what you had seen that day? That certainly, that photograph that you just showed me certainly appears to be similar type okay. items discovered by me on that date. And so those boxes were inside the white box? Correct and the weapons were inside the black boxes, which are the Smith & Wesson boxes that you testified to. That is correct. And I think the gun was in a cocked position to only show that it was not loaded. Is that correct? Well, I mean, I don't know if that weapon has a hammer on it or not. I, I'd have, I don't well, it looked like it was an automatic. Well, but I mean, but did you look? I can't tell from the photo if it was cocked. The, the slide was back on, <coughs> uh, which would be in a, a safe position. Okay. Did you ever examine the weapons yourself? Um, I did look at them, and I do maybe I don't remember 100% if I remember that the slide was back on them or not. Um, but immediately notified Lieutenant Jeff Heron, and then he took over from there. Okay. And the shotgun that you found was kind of standing up in that same room. It was. It was in a box. Okay. But in a shot or barrel up. Right. Officer, I don't believe any Officer person. Mitchell, could you could you come to the screen and show me where the uh, shotgun was located? I will, Your Honor. Sorry to interrupt, gentlemen. Your Honor, there be, may be another picture that shows it more accurately. Okay. Your Honor, this box right here, there's a there's a cardboard box here. Yes. Uh, the lid is shut on it. On the day that I went, the 13th of March. Uh huh. This if this is the same box. These, uh, they were opened up, and there was a shotgun sticking down inside right here. All right. Mr. Hurdle says there may be another picture that better shows it. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Your Honor. Cross examine or redirect, Mr. Hurdle. Um, Detective, how close were the uh, the shotguns to the uh, two Smith and Wesson that you found? Three feet, approximately. I didn't measure, but they had very close. Detective, I'm showing you um, State's Exhibit 2. The, the State's Exhibit 2, the, uh, the black barrel, do you recognize that sticking out? Uh, the shotgun barrel sticking out there, I do. And I'm sorry, approximately how close is that to the chair with the uh, boxes of Smith & Wesson's? A couple feet, two or three feet. Arms distance from you and I? Yes. 
That's it, Your Honor. Anything else, Mr. Boyles? No, Your Honor. <coughs> I think you're excused. Thank you, Your Honor. Receive release? Yes, sir. Thank you. Officer, I'll remind you not to discuss your testimony with anybody, nor allow them to discuss their testimony with you until this matter has been completed. I understand, Your Honor. Thank you. Call your next witness. Your Honor, say we call Derek to me. You may. I can try and retrieve him, Your Honor, when he stepped out. Well, I think he was asked to step out. <laughs> there was a motion. Were you sworn earlier, officer? Yes. You were? Yes. I'll consider you sworn under oath. You may proceed. Proceed to the witness stand. Proceed. Sir, would you state your name for the record? Merritt Toomey. And probably for the record, if you could spell, spell your first and last name. First name is Merritt, M-E-R-R-I-T-T. Last name is Toomey, T-O-O-M-E-Y. And Mr. Toomey, where are you employed? Indiana State Police. And what is your current uh, position with the Indiana State Police? I'm a first sergeant in the crime scene section. I'm sorry, how long have you been with the State Police? 32 years and a few months. And has it always been uh, as a crime scene technician, a supervisor there? No, I started out as a road trooper. I was a detective and then I was a crime scene investigator. And then just uh, within the last year and a half, I became the supervisor. Is it appropriate to call you sergeant or first sergeant? What, what's the, I'll uh, answer to either one. <laughs> first sergeant, uh, uh, were you asked to be a part of a search warrant on Tay Bridge uh, on March 13th, 2024? I was. Who reached out to you originally? Uh, that would be Lieutenant Heron. Have you worked with Detective Heron in the past ever before or not? Uh, on previous search warrants, I have. Uh, were you familiar with the uh, residents on Tay Bridge? Uh, it was my first time being there. And what was going to be your role on March 13th of this year? I was there to document the, the property. Were you to collect evidence or photograph in any way, shape, or form? I, I was photographing the, the property primarily uh, until uh, some evidence arose uh, that needed to be collected. I want to direct your attention to uh, the basement area. And uh, were you brought down to the basement area to look at, <coughs> photograph, and collect some evidence? I was. And uh, what sort of evidence was that? Uh, there were two guns that were still in boxes. Uh, I'd have to refer to my, my notes to uh, tell you the particulars. Do you recall who uh, directed you to those guns? That would have been uh, First Sergeant Mitchell. Do you work with uh, First Sergeant Mitchell much? I do. Um, did you photograph those guns? I did. Were they in a box or out of, bo of a box when you first saw them? Uh, they were in the, the box that they came in uh, from the company, and then both of those two boxes were inside of another cardboard box. So they were in their manufacturer's box? Correct. Inside of another box? Correct. And you photographed those? I did. I'm sorry, Your Honor, five, six, two, three, and four. I think you're over there. <coughs> we did not have, we did not have any markings. I apologize. The court has possession of them. I'm showing you what's already been admitted as states two, three, and four were those photographs that you would have taken on March 13th of the area where the uh, two guns were located. Yes. And would that have been prior to you looking, you personally looking in the boxes or post you looking into the boxes? Um, these would have been prior to me looking in the boxes. Okay. 
And then, Your Honor, if I could have states five also. Oh, I'm sorry, it's defense in one. That, that, that I believe is with you. Yeah, I'll get it. You don't have that. Your Honor, I promise I'm not going to hold on to anything. <laughs> Uh, states well, well. Exhibit 1, would you have taken that picture with the guns out of the box then? Yes, I did. Thank you. Give them to the court reporter so I don't lose them. <laughs> you, you collected those items, uh, First Sergeant? I did. Are they... Um, taken to the Indiana State Police Post and can be kept in the possession of the State Police uh, since that time. <coughs> yes, sir. Did you bring them with you? I did. If you could please get them out of their um, boxes, please. I'm going to put a sticker on it marked States Exhibit 5 for the first one, the one on top. And states exhibit six on the bottom one. Have those been in continuous custody uh, of the state police? You said since March 13th? Yes, sir. Uh, have they been altered or in any way, shape, or form? Uh, I just sealed the box. Okay, would you seal the boxes. box on that day or another day? Um, these would have been taken to the post on uh, the day that we collected them, put into secure storage, and then we uh, would have packaged everything up another day. Are they sealed currently? Yes, they are. Uh, is that with an evidence tape or seal that the state police uses regularly? Yes. Um, is it a lot of trouble for you to unseal them? I, you, you say to open it, open and I will. <laughs> Let's start with States Exhibit 5. I note that it's in some sort of blue plastic <coughs> bag. Is that something you would have done, or is that how you found that? No, this is the way they, they come from the factory. Okay. Could you take uh, State's Exhibit 5 out of the plastic? I'm going to put it in a safe mode here. Okay. okay. Gun is empty. so. Does that gun appear secure. to be in basically the same condition as when you found it on March 13th? Yes. Okay. If you could please put it back in the box and... Just for the record, if you could do the same thing to States Exhibit 6, uh, First Sergeant. Actually, don't put it back in yet. I want to look at it before you put it back in. Yes, sir. And Mr. Boyle may want to. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, I'll let Mr. Uh, First Sergeant Toomey open that box while I show the uh, Defense Council State Exhibit 5. Okay. If you could do make that gun also safe uh, for Sergeant as well, the same as you did with the uh, State Exhibit 5. And does States Exhibit 6 to be appear to be in the same condition as when you collected on March 13th? Yes. If you could then please replace that back into the, uh, the plastic container, and I will uh, allow the uh, Defense Council to uh, review that as well. Officer Pena, was this fingerprinted, or did you intend to have it fingerprinted, or no, anything? Sir. So it's acceptable to touch yes. without contaminating it? If you could put it in the box, uh, first sergeant. Okay. 
Your Honor, counsel for the defendant has indicated that there's no objection to the state's exhibits five and six. So the state would move to admit those items. So state's exhibit five and six admitted without objection. Thank you. Your Honor, I have no other questions for First Sergeant Timmons. Mr. Boyles, please record, Your Honor. Thank you. First Sergeant, I don't know, do your records show the serial numbers on those two weapons? Do you have that? Yes. Let's look at the first exhibit that you have there. Yes, sir. Okay. Are you familiar with the Indiana State Police property record and receipt form? Yes, sir. Okay. Are you the one that fills it out or does that then fill it out by Lieutenant Aaron? No, I took them into evidence, so I would have filled it out. Okay, perfect. I'm looking at item number 2055. Yes, sir. It said that's a sealed cardboard box containing a Smith & Wesson MP shield semi-automatic handgun. Does it have a serial number? It does. And what is that, sir? H as in Henry, N as in Nora, H as in Henry, 8324. Okay. And there's another item on there, a 2056. Yes, sir. Does that would be an indication of another weapon that was found? Yes. And that would also be listed as a Smith & Wesson MP shield semi-automatic handgun? Correct. Does that have a serial number? It does. And what is that, sir? H. Henry and Nora, J. John, 5682. Now, when you fill out these property record and receipt forms, do you ever indicate on there where the item was found? When necessary, yes. Okay. Can you tell me from that form, to refresh your recollection, does that show where those items were found? On there, I just have from the basement, from the Knoll basement. Okay. No specific indication it was on a table in a box? None of that, correct? Well, we use complementary things. The photographs work in tandem with the description of things. Okay. But if you just had this, you wouldn't have any idea where it was found. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Let me ask you this. Were you present on the August search? The August search, the first? No, sir. You were not there. Okay. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for purpose of identification as Defendant's Exhibit 2. I think Mr. Hurdle has no objection and ask you to take a look at this. Would you, please? Tell us what that is, if you can discern it from the exhibit. It's a receipt from Midwest Gun Exchange, Incorporated, from Mishawaka, Indiana. What's it dated? The date is 10-28-2017. Okay. Does it have a list of serial numbers of weapons purchased? Yes. And would those two serial numbers that were purchased from the Mishawaka Gun Store in 2017 be the same as the two weapons that you previously identified in the state's direct examination? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurdle. Thank you both for your arguments and briefs. We'll take the matter under advisement.
I don't have them memorized. I'd have to look at them again. You certainly can. You've got the weapons and you've got the receipt. So go right ahead. HNJ5682 matches this one. Okay. HNH8324 matches the other one. Okay, so the receipt showing the guns were purchased in Mishawaka in 2017 is supported by the identification both on the receipt and on the weapons with the serial numbers, is that right? Correct. Okay. Let me ask you, you testified on direct examination, something that you noticed was the fact that it was in a manufacturer's packaging. What does that mean? Uh, this box. This is what it came in. Okay. And what about the blue uh, kind of cellophane item that you had the weapon stuck in inside the box? What does that tell you? Uh, that's, that's, the way it, that's the way I found it inside of the box. So it appeared that that weapon had not been used and never out of the box since it was manufactured or at least was purchased? I, I can neither confirm nor deny that. Okay. It, it looks to be in good shape, but... Okay. Do you have the receipt? Or did you put it in the box here? Sorry. There you go. No problem. I've got to give this to the court. I'll get spanked. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Rose. You're welcome, Your Honor. Do you need these anymore? No, sir. You can put them back. All right. Um, And you're, how many people were doing that search, do you remember, at the house that day for going through the house? I, there was multiple people there. I couldn't tell you an exact number. You went to the room where the guns were found, is that correct? I went through the whole house. So I was in each of the rooms. I want to ask you a question about the particular room where the guns were found in a second, as soon as we get it up on the screen. Taking a look, uh, First Sergeant, at State's Exhibit number three, did that appear to be the way the room looked when you were there? Yes, sir. Okay. And where did you believe the guns were found? Can you show us like, from your uh, observation here? Uh, you can see the side of the white cardboard box. That's what I'm yes. pointing to? Okay. And was the table in this array, as you saw it that day, all yeah. kinds of other items on that? Yes, sir. It appeared that that's been there for a while, that all those items have kind of been uh, discarded down there? I, that's a possibility. <laughs> well, it could look like somebody's uh, not using that room a great deal, correct? Because they've got a lot of stuff on the table. It's not like it's being used every day. I've been in a lot of different houses in a lot of different states, sir. <laughs> They all don't look alike, do they? Correct. <laughs> this looks crowded, correct? Correct. All right. I don't believe I have anything further. Thank you very much. Redirect. No other questions for this witness, Sean? And I'll show defense exhibit number two. And then. No objection to the uh, receipt uh, that was uh, provided by the defense. Right? Correct. Is this staying with the court or going back with me? <laughs> Officer Toomey, did you examine the shotgun? Examine it? Yes. 
uh, we just took a cursory look at it because he was allowed to, to have that. I understand. Was it loaded? Um, I'm not the one who looked at it. Do you, do you recall who it was? No, sir. Do you know what kind it was? It was a police model, <clears throat> but... Most likely a 12 gauge? Yes, sir. You keep a shotgun for personal protection in the basement in this crowded area? Feel free to object to anybody. Is that where you'd keep one? Uh, if I, that is not where I would keep it, sir. Only if you're living in the basement. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. Court has If that <coughs> prompts questions from either side. Not on the court's question, John. No, Your Honor. Officer Timmy, thank you. Is he released from his subpoena? Yes, Your Honor. You're free to go. I'll remind you, uh, do not discuss your testimony with anybody. Do not allow anybody to discuss their testimony with you uh, until this matter is completed. First Sergeant, I believe the guns need to stay. Yes. Who do I give them to? Miss Lori. Hi, Miss Collada. Do we need to take a break? Take a break. Three o'clock. We'll be off record. All right. The judge decided to take a quick break. Um, so I'm on break right now. Uh, this is an exciting hearing. There's a lot of stuff going on here. It sounds like the judge is leaning towards, he shouldn't have had guns in there that was not the shotgun because, uh, you know, even the shotgun was in a strange place was kind of how uh, we left the room there. The judge was saying, that shotgun being in the basement, it's a little weird um, to think that you're actually protecting yourself, leaving your gun downstairs in the basement in a cluttered room. Because I think the defense is trying to say that the room is cluttered and that therefore it's not used and that these guns were accidentally left there. We'll see what they actually say. So keep watching, guys. Call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. State's call is Jeff Heron. Officer Heron, you were sworn earlier, correct? Yes, sir. Sir, would you uh, state your full name for the record? Jeffrey C. Heron. And your, uh, spell your last name for the record? Uh, Mr. Heron, where are you employed? Indiana State Police. What is your current um, rank or title with the state police? I'm a lieutenant in charge of investigation for what we call Area 5, which is three different districts in the center part of the state, like Will Pendleton and Dallas. Are you uh, in charge of, uh, I'm sorry, investigations? I am in charge of investigations. I supervise Rural Team Health. I protect these in recent days. Who is the lead investigator in the Virginia Hill investigation? I am. And when did you become involved in the Virginia Hill investigation? I got the case on, on uh, June 13th, 2023, and I started the investigation in July 13th, 2023. And since um, July of 2023, uh, have you been the affiant on um, all search warrants? I have. How many are we up to now? 51. Have you been a part of every interview of every witness thus far? I have been, yes. And have you been a part of the arrest of all three individuals in uh, Jamie Knoll, Casey Knoll, and Missy Knoll? Yes, sir. I, Let's, I want to have a brief discussion. The, uh, the August search warrant of Tay Bridge, were you a like, part of that? I was the author of that search warrant, and I directed that, but I never actually went to the Tay Bridge location on August 16th. Who is the owner and occupant of the Tay Bridge home back in August of 2023? Jamie Knoll. And was that verified at the time of the warrant? It was, yes. At some point in time, uh, was there an arrest warrant for uh, the defendant, Jamie Knoll? Yes, there was. And was he ultimately arrested and had an initial hearing here in this courtroom? He was, yes. 
Do you remember uh, when the initial hearing was? November 9th, 2023. And at the time of the initial hearing, what was the defendant's place of residence at that time? 3001 Old Tay Bridge, Jeffersonville, Indiana. The same time or the same place that it was in August of 2023? That's correct. Is that the address that he provided to the court at uh, his initial hearing pursuant to the, uh, the IRS Indiana Risk Assessment? Yes, it is. Were you present for that initial hearing? I was, yes, sir. Were you present when the judge gave Mr. Null his conditions with respect to firearms? I was, yes, sir. Okay, were you in the courtroom specifically then? I was, yes. Um, were you a part of the collection of any firearms? I was on the receiving end of those firearms at the post after they were collected. Okay, back, let's back up just one second. The day of the initial hearing, November of 2023, uh, were you asked either by the court or the parties on that day approximately how many guns there were? I was, yes, by oh, the judge. How many were there? There ended up being, I believe, 82 approximately. And what was your understanding of the court's order at that initial hearing? That Mr. Knoll surrender all firearms except for one shotgun for home defense. And you state that some of those weapons were brought to the Indiana State Police Post. What district? District 45, the Sellersburg Post. Is that something you logged or inventoried personally? No, I was there when they were delivered, but I did not log or inventory them. When you were present, who delivered uh, the guns? So uh, Charlie Moon, um, Bradley Kramer, and also present to observe was a Matt Owens for a period of time. Was Jamie Knoll, the defendant, present at that time? He was not. Do you know where he was at that time? I believe he was still incarcerated or in the process of being released. So the turning over the weapons was something prior to him being released? That was my understanding at the time. Um, since my discussions with Bradley Kramer, I understand maybe he was released slightly early when that was still in the process of going on. And you were there basically as an observer with respect to those guns? Correct. Okay. Did somebody from the Indiana State Police log and inventory those? Yes. Do you know who that was or do you recall? So it was Sergeant Andy Taylor, Sergeant Merritt Toomey, and Sergeant uh, Phil D'Angelo with the Indiana State Police. They were the ones that logged those and provided and filled out the uh, property record receipts. And you said that was November 9th, 2023? Yes, sir. Do you know where the defendant moved back to when he was released from incarceration? It's my understanding it was 3001 Old Tay Bridge. Now, I want to direct your attention to the um, Tom James search warrant, for lack of a better term. Are you familiar with that search warrant? I am, yes, sir. Who wrote that search warrant? I did. What number of search warrant was that? 45. And just briefly for the court, Tom James is what? It's a uh, high-end uh, clother, or clother, a uh, um, tailored custom um, outfits clothing for men and women. And the search warrant itself was to collect what? So it was to collect the, uh, the, the items that were purchased, the men's suits, the belts, the, the shoes. I had, I had attached to the search warrant an exhibit, which was multiple pages of a history of purchases from Jamie Knoll uh, that I had provided the court. It was to re receive those. He had ultimately purchased, I believe, total $183,000 using the Utica Fire Department money to, to buy purchase clothes from Tom James, and, uh, and then I took the last five years for the statute of limitations and used those records in order to seize those items because they were purchased with, uh, ultimately with Utica money, with Utica Volunteer Firefighters Association money, and uh, I was seizing those because they were part of the case. Were you looking for any sort of uh, paperwork, receipts, et cetera, anything else the, for any of those, uh, that items or payroll? Right, the documents and the uh, receipts that went along with those, those items. What day did you serve that search warrant? March 13th, 2024. Who was the uh, officer in charge at that scene? I was. 
Um, who was all present? Roughly how many officers were present uh, on March 13th? I believe we had seven plus the State Board of Accounts. We had two uniformed troopers, uh, four detectives, and then a CSI, and then a State Board of Accounts. Uh, Is this agent. something you coordinated or somebody else? I coordinated all of that. Once you received the warrant, did you immediately go to the house? Explain how the uh, March 13th kind of went? So I had, I had uh, as I was looking through the different American Express purchases, I had saw the $183,000, and so I had contacted uh, Tom James, and I ended up speaking to an attorney for, for that business, and then he provided those documents uh, to me. And then he, during that conversation, he said that uh, Mr. Knoll had purchased a, a uh, suit of clothing, various clothing, on, I believe it was December 22nd, 2000, I believe it was 23, and that those items had not been delivered yet. And then and, uh, he told me later that those items would be delivered on March 13th, 2024. Uh, in the morning, he told me roughly between 9 and 9.30. Let me back, back up one second. He was arrested on November 9th? Correct. You were provided information from Tom James that he used the Utica credit card on December 22nd? Yes. And the suit was going to be delivered on March 13th? Correct. Okay. Um, so, on March 13th, you're at the home or you're waiting for the defendant to be there? So we were told, so I'd, I'd written the search warrant the night before with exception of the facts that were going to unfold that morning, so I didn't have to write the entire search warrant that morning. We were told that the suit was going to be delivered roughly 9, 9.30 in the morning, and I knew who the, uh, who the uh, salesman was, and that was uh, Jordan Yoakum, and Mr. Yoakum, I had been in contact with him and uh, over the phone, and he'd indicated about 8.50 that morning that he would be there in about 10 minutes, about 9 o'clock. He described the vehicle he was driving, which was a white uh, Lincoln Aviator, and uh, so we had sat, myself and Detective Hanson had sat in our car uh, down the street and we watched for the white Lincoln av Aviator. And as it had, had pulled up, uh, then once it had left, I confirmed that the suit was delivered and then I finished the authoring of that next paragraph of my search warrant and I sent it to the judge. Uh, while that was going on, I'd also called Dave Mitchell that morning and then Merritt Toomey and asked for detectives and uniform officers to stage uh, a couple of miles away so they wouldn't be seen in order to, when I executed the search warrant, so they would meet me there at the scene once we decided to execute that and the judge had signed the search warrant. How long did you wait then before you went to the Tabor home? So our, our initial plan was to wait, uh, obviously, until the search warrant got issued. So, so once it got, got, uh, got signed, we moved a little closer so we could see the front of the house to make sure Jamie Noel didn't leave with that particular suit in question. And so, uh, so once we got a little closer, uh, we saw him come out and, and open the door of a silver uh, Mercedes Benz. And when he did, we thought he was possibly getting ready to leave. It looked like he was getting into the car. And so I, I went ahead and pushed it up. My original thought was I was going to allow for a little bit of time to go by to not burn or to not uh, uh, put Mr. Yoakum uh, in front of, uh, of, of everybody having, having said that he cooperated with state police because he was concerned about that. Once you got to the, uh, the home, was there anyone outside then? So once we pulled up a, a little farther away door, at the intersection there to where we could actually see the house, we saw Mr. Noel come out. When he did, he got in the car. At that point, I called uh, Detective Mitchell and, uh, and Sergeant uh, Toomey and said, come on, bring everybody down. We're going to go ahead and execute the search warrant. And so we, we me and Detective Hanson pulled in uh, to the driveway there. At that point, Mr. Noel was still out by the uh, silver Mercedes Benz and we confronted him. I explained to him that I had a warrant that I wanted to read to him, and then I, I, uh, I got relatively close to him, and then I read him the warrant verbatim. Uh, so he understood what we were searching for, and then I provided him a copy of a list of the items we were searching for. Was there anyone else outside the home from the, uh, the house? Not from the house, no. And did you, once you read him the warrant, provided him a copy of the warrant, did you go in? We waited. He said, uh, I asked him if anybody else were in the house. He said that both of his daughters, uh, Casey and Gracie, we're inside of the residence. I said, would you please call them? He called them on the phone with, my, with me being present there. He asked them to get their belongings together and come on out. After about eight to 10 minutes, they still hadn't emerged from the house. I said, I think it's best that we go in. And so Mr. Knoll said, hey, let me, I will show you where these items of clothing are, where, where I keep them. 
Uh, and so he actually led the way and we went into the house. We entered into the kitchen. Uh, as we entered into the kitchen, he walked over to the basement door. He opens the basement door. He yelled for Casey to come out. Um, he, I apparently didn't know where she was at. And then Casey and Gracie came down the stairs from upstairs. And then at that point, we asked them to get their belongings and leave, and they did. And then he, after they left, he walked us down uh, and showed us the suit that he just received, which was now on the couch uh, in the living room. And then he walked us into the master bedroom and walked us around there and showed us where his different closets were. And, uh, and then, he, uh, then he turned and walked out, and then we walked down into the basement, uh, and he showed us where other items were in the basement, which was over by that table that we've been talking to this, this afternoon. Did uh, you detain the defendant there at the time then or not? I told him he was free to go. Did he leave? He eventually did left. He left at, uh, we served the warrant at about 1034, 1035 in the morning, and he left at about 1050. So he, let, he stuck around about 15 to 16 minutes. Were Casey or Gracie detained at all? They were not. They were told they were free to leave. They actually went outside for a minute, and then they asked, uh, Detective Hanson went out, and they asked, Casey asked if she could get additional items of clothing and he escorted her back in and then she went back out and stayed until I believe Mr. Noel came out and uh, got into his Mercedes Benz. Once you started the search, had they already left? What error? He actually got into a BMW. Once we started the search, um, yes. Well, Merritt Toomey, I had directed him to take photographs all around the house, which is standard procedure, and then once we got into the house, uh, once it was secure and we figured there was nobody else in there, then he had started his photography throughout the house. Who determined who was going to search in which room of the home? We were all standing in the kitchen. We say, oh, that was the, the uniform detectives, or uniform officers and the detectives, and I broke them up into teams. Uh, I sent Detective Mitchell, and, uh, or, or First Sergeant Mitchell, and, uh, and uh, James Donahoe and Chris Hansen down initially with him into the basement, and then uh, um, the other detective your name escapes me, and then one of the, the uh, uniformed troopers into, the, into Mr. Moll's bedroom to start doing a search. I provided both of them with copies of the list of the different items we were looking for and explained to them on those particular items. If I had been having gone actually to met me with the attorney, he had showed me that on the inside pocket, each one of these particular suits uh, were monogrammed. It had Jamie's old name on it. It had a lot number and a series of other numbers, and a lot of those numbers correlated with those documents that we had. <coughs> So we were able to seize what we believe to be those exact items on that list. And you provided them lists? I provided both of them lists, both teams list. Were you, did you designate yourself to a particular area or were you kind of uh, monitoring what was happening? Because I was a supervisor, it was my, my crime scene or my, my case, I, I, I moved around throughout the, throughout the day. Roughly how long after the search started did Detective Mitchell contact you about uh, the basement? Uh, probably 20 minutes or so. He, uh, he uh, contacted me and said, hey, I, find a, I found a couple of firearms down here. Uh, would you come down here and take a look? And did you go to the basement? I did. Detective, I'm showing you what's up and marked for identification purposes, States Exhibit 7. Okay. Do you recognize uh, that diagram? This is a diagram I asked uh, Detective Hansen to make of the basement of the, of the uh, 3001 Old Tay Bridge, Jamie Knowles residence. And does it give a, obviously not to scale, but does it give an accurate depiction <coughs> of the, uh, the layout of the basement? It, it, it does. It's not to scale, but it does. To me, that, having been through that basement, it does lay out a, uh, that's it is an accurate description of the basement. Your no Honor, objection, State, Your Honor. State, it states Exhibit 7. I think I heard Mr. Boyle saying no objection. No objection, Your Honor. States Exhibit 7 admitted for motion purposes. Now, if, if you could, without the aid of uh, defend, defendant, I'm sorry, States Exhibit 7, walk the judge to the location of the uh, firearms that Detective Mitchell pointed out to you. As you walk down the stairs to the basement, um, the first room you enter will be. Uh, a, a finished uh, open room. There's a bar off to one side. And there's a there's a there's a uh, sorry a uh, um, a living room with furniture and everything. And then there's ultimately a, a, a an exit door and a patio out to go ultimately to the pool of the residence. And then if you continue to walk straight, and that's what I did, knowing I'd been down there just a moment before with Mr. Noel. If you walk straight, you go into your right is a movie room, and off to your left, there's like a little sitting area table. 
uh, with a lot of items on top of the table off to your left hand side and then there's like a, a curtain where there's some some uh, HVAC system and I think believe a sump pump and things like that there's one of those blinds set up there were there any um, bedrooms located in the basement there was but uh, before when you enter that main living room as soon as you go down the stairs off to the left there's a bedroom and I believe that was Casey's bedroom is where that was it's off to the left and um, from the base of the steps in the basement approximately how far were the was the table chairs and firearms ultimately located so the room is probably 15 foot wide maybe a little bit wider so 15 feet from the base of the stairs then into that room where the table is and so then another five or six feet and once you enter into that room off to the left is the table once detective mitchell got in there did you observe the uh the firearms and the boxes that they were contained in, I believe, states exhibits five and six, the Smith and Wessons. I did. He he showed me and said, "Hey, I look. I, I pulled this out, meaning the chair out. I saw I saw this white box, and on the top of that box, uh, you could clearly see uh, a Smith and Wesson box, which I recognized as being a a uh, firearm box." four pages titled States Exhibits 8 and 9. You stated that you were present for the initial hearing of the defendant on November 9th. Yes. And do States Exhibits 8 and 9, what are they? Uh, so States Exhibit 8 is an order directing the transport and retention of certain firearms of the defendant. States Exhibit 9 is order on initial hearing. firearms that were collected on March 13th, roughly a, a month ago, um, were those shotguns? No, we collected two pistols, two semi-automatic 9mm Smith & Wesson pistols. Did you collect those based on these orders and the verbal order from the judge on November 9th, 2023? Yes. So I was present in the court when that order, order was issued by the judge. As During the search for our items of clothing, receipts, we found those two firearms. I immediately thought that that would be contraband, so I asked for further uh, instructions from you. Uh, but uh, it was all my intentions because of hearing the judge's order, I uh, was going to seize those items. And I did ultimately direct that those be seized. No objection, Your Honor. Your Honor, I believe probably the court could probably take judicial notice, but the state would move to admit states exhibits eight and nine, the court's orders and the felony cause. So states exhibits eight and nine admitted. Did you also note a, uh, a shotgun located in the basement? I did. Is that something that uh, you collected? I did not collect. I did not have an order to be collected. I, again, I was present for the judge's order that <clears throat> Mr. Knoll retained one shotgun. Uh, before we left, I made sure we did not find any other firearms, and therefore that was the shotgun that I believed he was legally entitled to, to own or by the court, so I, I left that. Can you describe the shotgun to the court? I believe it was a pump shotgun, still had a tag on it, uh, was not loaded, and it was sitting, uh, it was in a box, and you could see the barrel sticking out, and I believe you had a picture of it earlier. So the, the exhibit that was admitted through uh, Detective Mitchell, you would agree that that appears to be uh, true and accurate as how you saw it that day also? Yes. The, uh, the two Smith & Wesson in the boxes, do you know if they were loaded at the time? They were not loaded. Uh, did you physically take them out of the boxes, examine them at all, and look at them? So Sergeant Toomey initially took them out. I did pick them up while he had them out after he was done taking photographs, and I, I got the serial numbers off them, and then ultimately called um, who I believe to be the seller of that firearm in order to verify that those were owned by Mr. Knoll. The defendant uh, admitted an exhibit or receipt uh, for those two weapons, 
and, and you were in the courtroom here just a little while ago when, when that happened. Yes. So is that your findings as well? That they were purchased from, uh, I believe, Midwest Guns? Midwest Exchange, yes. And I, I got all the paperwork associated with that, including the 4473s, which is the federal document which the purchaser has to fill out, including their name and, and list of questionnaires, and including this, included the serial numbers that were mentioned today, included those two firearms. Was there any ammunition found at the home? There was. Was that ammunition um, seized as well? It was not seized. Um, to my knowledge, the judge didn't say anything about not having possession of, of uh, ammunition, so I did not seize that. It was 9 millimeter ammunition. Uh, it's still in the box. How long have you been with the state police? 35 years. And can you just tell us the, uh, the different roles you had with the state police or ranks? So I started out in... Uh, in uh, November of uh, 2000, 1990, 1988, goodness, goodness, sorry. I started out in November uh, 1988. I was a road trooper until uh, out of the Indianapolis Post, then ultimately out of the Putnamville Post until uh, um, October of 95. Then I became a detective, a district detective, worked Putnamville District, three counties. Uh, and then from there, uh, 2000, I got promoted to investigative squad sergeant in the Indianapolis Post until 2005, then I got, I got promoted to uh, District Investigative Commander of the Putterville Post until 2016, and then I've held the current position, which is Area Investigative Commander, from 2016 until now. And, and so 29 years of being a detective, and then uh, seven years as being a, ish of being a, uh, a uh, road trooper. How many people did you say report to you? I believe it's 25, I think. I'd have to add up. 25 plus three civilians. Um. As a supervisor and 30 plus years on the, uh, the state police, um, have you ever been asked to enforce court orders? Yes. You ever disregard court orders? Uh, not intentionally, no. What if your employees disregard court orders? Uh, they are instructed that's part of their duties, and if, if we, depending on the situation, they ultimately would get written up, and then we possibly look into the situation, and they could face disciplinary action, depending on the degree of what they, they did or didn't do. Is a subpoena to come to court a court order? Yes. If somebody would disregard a subpoena, would that be important? Yes. They can get in trouble. Disciplinary possibility? Possibly. You worked the road for a period of time. I did. Occasionally still put on the uniform. Ever stop anybody for a uh, traffic violation? Hundreds, if not thousands. Judge, I'm going to object to relevancy now. That doesn't do much to do with the Mars. Mr. Irwin. Your Honor, the relevancy is um, the, the issue of the defendant being a law enforcement officer for nearly 30 years working the road, stopping people. And I'm sure at times there were people who denied ownership of contraband, who said it wasn't mine, who point to somebody else in the home, or I didn't know it was there. And I'm merely trying to uh, elicit that from this way. Judge, those aren't relevant because we don't know any of the facts of those cases. It's, it's speculation, clearly. Well, many of the years he was supervisor, he wasn't on the road. He's only been on the road seven years. But oh. as it contains this issue for this court, he has no evidence that he could indicate to the court. It's all speculation of what he may have done or what somebody may have done in the past. Mr. Erdahl, I'll sustain that objection, but I get the point. All right, thank you, Judge.
Did you examine the other items on that table, uh, Detective? Some of them. Did they appear to be men's, women's, or could you even tell? A lot of them were men's, and a lot of them were items that were listed on our on the documents that I provided. Was there Tom James uh, apparel, shoes, clothes, etc., located in that general area by that table? So there were items. So when you say Tom James, so on that list there was like different brands of shoes that weren't specifically Tom James, but they were sold by Tom James. And there was belts, seven eight hundred dollar belts or eight hundred nine hundred dollar shoes that were were listed on that itemized list that were sold by Tom James. I don't recall there being a suit that was specifically a Tom James brand suit on that table around that. But again, those other items were around. I don't believe I have any other questions for uh, this witness. Cross examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Please, the court. Uh, Lieutenant, uh, let's go back a little ways in time. August 16th of 2023. Uh, did you have an occasion to be involved in the search of uh, Mr. Knowles' home on that date? I was the author of the search warrant and was directing that. Uh, Bill Dalton was ultimately in charge of that, and I never went to Mr. Knowles' house. You never went there that day? That day. But you were in charge of either getting the search warrant or putting items that you thought would be appropriate in that search warrant to be asked to be seized. Is correct. That correct. Yes. Uh, was one of those items weapons? No. You didn't ask for any weapons at that time, did you? You asked for books and records. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, how many people went on that search? On August the 16th? Yes, sir. Approximately 40 in different locations. We had four different locations. Mr. Knowles. Let's talk just about the house. I would have to go back and look at my notes, but I believe I, I sent four or five in each team. Okay. Um, and when you send a team to a particular location, because now you've got four locations, 40 people, do you suggest to the team what they're supposed to look for and where they're supposed to look for it? I give them a copy of the search warrant. I had a briefing that morning, explained to them what the search warrant entailed at each location, made sure there was an OIC officer in charge of, of each scene, and explained the process of processing the, processing the different house, the whole barn, whatever, the fire stations, and what items were allowed to be seized and what I was looking for. Were you looking for boxes that had receipts? We were looking for anything that had bank records. I mean, if, if a box had a receipt in it or You'd a bank record. You'd look in it, wouldn't it? Of course. Yeah. Yeah, that, that'd be an item that you would want to look at, correct? Sure. Okay. Uh, and on August 13th, you took pictures of areas in the house, or somebody within <coughs> this team of 40 people took some pictures, or the evidence technician at some point took pictures. Not on August 13th, on August 16th we did. You got the date wrong, Mr. Wells. Yeah. Did, did you take pictures? They did. Okay. Who suggested that? There wasn't a suggestion. It was I was telling them to do it, and they did it. Okay, and uh, you asked them to be thorough in their process, didn't you, about taking pictures and getting those receipts and things that the warrant requested? Yes. Okay. ask you uh, to take a look at this photograph which has been marked as Defendant's Exhibit 3. Ask you, can you identify that? That is a picture of the basement of Jamie Knowles' residence, 3001 Old Tate Bridge. That's a picture of the basement as you come down the stairs and look to the left in the table that I've been explaining. Is that the picture that you sent to uh, Mr. Stewart on uh, August or April the 8th? It's one of the pictures, yes. And so that's a picture you're familiar with, and you, uh, I think we requested it, and you sent it over. I correct? did? Yes. Uh, could you look at that picture and indicate, is there a white box located in that picture? Uh, yes, it's uh, okay. on top of the chair that's pushed in under the table. Okay, and that's the white box that we've talked about that's 
was the white box where the weapons were found in March. Is that correct? That appears to be correct, yes. Okay. So on August the 16th, with all these people, uh, some of which were directed to go to the home of Mr. Knoll and search for documents, correct? Correct. And you indicated to me earlier that boxes were important, that they may contain receipts and all kinds of things that you thought or that people doing the search would be interested in to comply with the search warrant, correct? Yes. Okay. And that white box was there on August the, when that search was conducted. On August, August the 16th, based on the picture, I wasn't again at the scene, sure. based on the picture and what I've been told. It, Did anybody ever tell you that they went through the box on August 16th to look for receipts? And oh my gosh, we found Smith and Western weapons. Uh, I had a discussion with both uh, First Sergeant Mitchell. Well, just answer my question. Well, I'm trying to. Did anybody ever tell you that they went through that box on August 16th to look for receipts? The answer would be, they told me they went through multiple boxes, multiple okay. rooms, and they found multiple weapons. Sir, and so multiple boxes would be really all the boxes that would be important that are hiding receipts in that very crowded room, correct? Could be, sure. Okay, but you're not there, so you're trusting them to do a complete search. Right. Okay, and were weapons located in the house that day? I was told yes. Okay, and where were they? Throughout the house. Okay, and were they picked up? No, it was not subject to my search warrant. Okay, so the weapons were left in the house? Correct. Okay. But all the receipts that you believed were in the house that were important were taken on that search? Unless we missed some, yes. Sure. Well, you would assume, would you not, that that box, that white box sitting on the chair, which was there in August, would have been looked through by somebody in order to look for receipts. It's a box, it's open, it's along with other boxes, and we're looking for receipts, so you never know where receipts go. You would have looked through that. Wouldn't the team have looked through that? I would assume so. Okay. Did anybody ever tell you on August the 17th, the next day, oh, by the way, we found two Smith & Wesson's weapons in that box? No, but the box didn't come up. Okay. And again, they told me that there was multiple firearms throughout the house. They told me a, a number of different things. They described the inside of the residence because I wasn't there. Well, if they had found the weapon, the rest of the house, they would have said something to you. Oh, by the way, when we're looking through receipts, we found two Smith & Wesson boxes in the basement in a white box on a table with all kinds of other stuff. No, they would not have. Okay. They wouldn't have told you that. No, they wouldn't have. Yeah. It was they immature. Didn't. It's just a Smith & Wesson box, and we're only looking for receipts, so we're not going to mention it to the lieutenant. Correct. But you did find weapons. Well, again, they mentioned it to me. They said, hey, there's a bunch of firearms in the house. Throughout the house, there were firearms. Okay. So you said leave them there. No problem. Correct. We're not looking for guns. We're looking for receipts. Right. Okay. So you were asked on direct that those weapons were purchased in 2017, correct? I don't believe you asked me when the exact purchase was, but it was, they were... October of 2017. The firearms were purchased according to the receipt I, I received from Mr. Morrison at Midwest Gun Express Exchange, said that they were purchased on October 28, 2017. In uh, what city? So Mishawaka, Indiana. However, I believe, and I haven't verified that yet, um, some of the firearms, especially the ones he bought with the American Express Utica card, were shipped to Keesler's police supply, even though they were purchased via the phone and paid for, they were then shipped to Keesler's police supply, and then they were ultimately, paperwork was done there, and then they were receded over to Mr. Knoll. But the two we're interested in were identified by First Sergeant Mitchell as being purchased on the 17th, 2017. Correct. Those were purchased on 2017, but ac actually where they were obtained from, I mean, I'm not I'm not sure. They could have been obtained actually from Keesler's <clears throat> police supply here in Jeffersonville, Indiana. I know they were bought at, at up in Mishawaka. And you know that they were still, according to Lieutenant Mitchell, in their original supply packages. It appeared to be, yes. Okay. You believe that to be true, and so does Lieutenant Mitchell, or Sergeant Mitchell. 
I didn't mean to promote him. <laughs> That's Carter's problem. Uh, is that correct? That he was promoted? Or what was the question? <laughs> the question was that First Sergeant Mitchell testified to the court that it's his opinion from his firearms experience or background as a documenter of material for the state police that those appeared to be in their original packaging. They did, yes. That's the, that's the picture. Has this been admitted? <coughs> it's, it is the same. It's the same. Yes. Your Honor, just for the record, I wanted to be clear that this is a picture taken from the August Correct. search. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. And not from the March. Correct. Okay. I have no objection to that, Judge. All right. Show me. What's that? Lieutenant, I'm going to have you look at the screen. Uh, that is a picture that has been introduced by the state. Is that white box that was picture taken in March of 2024 appear to be the same white box that was in your picture in August of 2023? Yes. I have no further questions. Thank you, sir. Redirect. No other questions, Your Honor. Officer Heron, you've got to remember I'm from Washington County. Yes, sir. What in the hell does an $800 belt look like? Um, I was a little surprised at that myself. Uh, um, he had a number of those. It looked pretty normal to the same kind of belt that I wear, which is about 30 bucks, but uh, didn't look a whole lot different. And um, Mr. Boyle suggested that the shotgun in the basement would be an appropriate place if someone lived there. Did it appear as if Mr. Knoll was living in the basement? No, it appeared he lived upstairs in the bedroom because that's where his <coughs> personal effects were, his, his uh, clothing was, his, his coat that he retrieved from in there. It looked like he was living upstairs in the master bedroom. So that prompts questions from anyone? Not from the state, Your Honor. I have one question. Yes, sir. The shotgun still had a tag on it. It was brand new, didn't it? It did, yes. When was it purchased? I don't know the answer to that. Where did it purchase from? I, I would have to look at my records and see. Okay. Nothing further. Thank you. Oh. Mr. Turtle? Your Honor, the state doesn't have any more witnesses. No. I, oh, do you sorry. have any other I'm, questions? I'm sorry. I, <coughs> I have no other questions. Okay. You didn't happen to ask him where the shotgun was that I allowed him to keep for personal protection, did you? I did not ask him that, no. Uh, that prompts any further questions? No, Your Honor. Officer Heron, you may step down. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Any other witnesses, Mr. Hurl? No, Your Honor. Just a moment. Right, just go, a moment? Just a moment before we go forward. How do you find a moment, Mr. Moe? Judge, I'm a lawyer. You know that. I know. So go much, back. As much go as go to the back. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, we can just have a moment to chat before we follow it. All right. I'll be off right. Thank you, Judge. <laughs> there are, there are, yes. All right. Back on the record. Call your next. Call your first witness, Mr. Wilder. Your Honor, we call Bradley Kramer. Mr. Kramer, you were sworn earlier, correct? Pardon? You were sworn earlier? No, sir. You were not? Would you raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under the penalties for perjury testimony about to give and leave the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, Your Honor. Have a seat. Thank you. Answer counsel's you questions, and the court may have some questions. Good afternoon, Mr. Kramer. Good afternoon. So you're here, and you understand why you're here to ask some questions or answer some questions regarding some events that took place uh, back in November 9th, 2023, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So 
prior to did that we, day. Did we have him identify himself for the record? Well, I thought everybody knew Brad. Did you state your full name for the record? Bradley Kramer. And uh, I'm not asking any other person. That's fine. Information. That's fine. Thank you, sir. So, Bradley, you're here as a result of some things that took place on November 9th of 2023, correct? Yes, sir. And that was a day that uh, Mr. Knoll was arraigned his initial hearing occurred in this courtroom, right? Yes, sir. And you were here? Yes, sir. And as a result of your being here, you were asked uh, to go to the home that he lived lives in with his wife on Old Tate Bridge Road, right? Yes, sir. And you were asked to go there uh, to uh, retrieve the firearms that were in the home, right? Yes, sir. And you, why did you need to go retrieve the firearm? At that point in time, I believe it was the, the court's order that all of his firearms needed to be removed from his home, aside from uh, one shotgun, I believe. And uh, I went to the house to retrieve those items. In, in fact, the one shotgun that you were aware that Mr. Lowe was allowed to keep, you saw that in the basement. Objection. Did you see the shotgun in the basement? I saw a shotgun in the basement, yes. Yeah. Okay. And that was on November 9th? Yes. Okay. And you left? Yes. Because you understood the judge allowed the shotgun to be left? Yes. And when you say you saw it in the basement, we've heard a lot of testimony. There's an area <coughs> in the basement that's kind of unfinished, right? No, it was not in that room, no, sir. Okay. Where was it? Uh, it was in the finished portion of the basement. Where the table? Near near the, the, the table, yes. Near the table where all the boxes are. Yes, sir. Okay. If, if I could, Ms. Fleeman, could you put the See, I've never seen that before. So. I, I, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trying to figure out how we end up with this show. But we need to. Okay. So this has been put in. This is a photograph that's been put into evidence, Mr. Kramer. Uh, is can you tell us? Are you familiar with, or is that something you recognize? Yes, sir. Okay. Tell us what it is that you recall that to be. Um, it, it is a table with stuff on it. Where at? Uh, in the basement of of Jamie Knoll's house. Okay. And this is is this the area where you saw the shotgun that you left? I, yeah, I believe so. It was in that general vicinity. Yes. Okay. And so you, your purpose was to to go to gather up the firearms. Yes. And you went with somebody, right? Yes, sir. It was Mr. Moon. Yes, sir. Somebody you didn't know. No, sir. And. You and Mr. Moon went in the house. Yes, sir. And you were going through the home to get the guns. Mm -hmm. And while you were doing that, Mr. Noel, Jamie called you on the phone as well. Yes, sir. Telling you where guns were located. Yes, sir. Where, when you went down there in that area, were there guns other than that shotgun that was left down in that general area? Yes, sir. Can you tell, tell the judge about what guns were just there. Um, I don't recall exactly how many the quantity. I didn't keep an inventory of where I found uh, what guns, uh, but there were several boxes of unopened, I, know, I guess rifles. I don't know if there were rifles or shotgun, but uh, longer guns. Um, and I don't specifically remember if there were handguns near or, or around that, that area, because there was quite a bit of guns that were retrieved that day. And when you, when there was a box with a, a gun in it, shotgun, you said you saw some boxes with shotgun. There was a boxes, unopened boxes with long guns in them. I don't know if there were shotguns or rifles. Okay. Did you open the boxes? No, we just took the boxes. Took the boxes. Yes, sir. And then um, Detective Harrod previously testified there were about 82 guns that were brought to the state police box. Okay. And, and you, you, and Mr. Moon, brought those guns to the state police box, correct? Yes, sir. Do you have a recollection of when you were there retrieving those guns if you saw this white box? No, sir, I don't. I understand.
Mr. Kramer, when you were asked to assist in collecting all of the guns in the house, you knew that was a pretty important request. Yes, sir. Why was it important in your opinion? Because uh, the court ordered it. <laughs> and when you were there trying to get all the guns that were in Mr. Knowles' house, you looked for them and tried to find them. No, sir. I didn't search for anything, if that's the, the correct verbiage. I was directed towards areas where guns may be. Okay. And, and when you say you didn't search, you didn't search in, your, in a professional sense of search? Y yes, sir. It's not something, if in a professional capacity, being a law enforcement officer in the past, like it's not like how I would necessarily, I wouldn't consider what I did a search. Mr. Herbert, cross examination. I'm sorry, who directed you, uh, Mr. Kramer, uh, to the locations of the guns? Uh, Jamie did. And that was via telephone, yep. FaceTime, Zoom, what, what, what was it? Just telephone, yes, sir. Okay, so if he told you to look in a closet, you looked in a closet. If he told you to look in a drawer, you looked in a drawer. If he told you to look uh, in the bedroom, you looked in the bedroom. Yes, sir. I think all I have. Mr. Wild, redirect. Yes, sir. And when you were being directed to where the guns were, Mr. Null told you that there were guns up in the bedroom, right? Yes, sir. And you went up to the bedroom, and there they were. Yes. And you got those. Yes. And he directed you that there were guns in that area as well, right? Yes, sir. And you went there, and you found guns there. Yes, sir. So. Where Mr. Knoll directed you and told you there were guns, there were guns there. Yes, sir. And you collected them. I collected the, the guns that I saw, yes, sir. And you felt like you got them all? I felt like I got the guns where he directed me to find them. Yeah. And he directed you and told you that there were guns here. Objection. State your objection. He didn't state that he was told to go there by Mr. Knoll. I, don't, I think there's a mischaracterization of the I, testimony. If you could rephrase the question. Thank you. So when Mr. Knoll was talking to you about where the guns were, right? Yes, sir. Did he tell you there were guns down in that part of the basement? Yes, sir. Okay. So Mr. Knoll directed you to where the guns were and you found guns in that area? Right? Yes, sir. Okay. And no further questions. Mr. Hurdle. No, Thank you, Mr. Kramer. You're, is he excused? Your Honor, we have no question. Nothing from the state, Your Honor. You're free to go. Thanks, sir. Uh, if you leave the courtroom, I will direct you not to discuss your testimony with anybody, nor allow them to discuss their testimony with you or anything else about this matter until this matter is completed. I would very much like that. <laughs> Thanks, sir. <laughs> Thank you for your patience, Mr. Lyle. Thank you, Jeff. Call your next witness. <coughs> Your Honor, we don't have any further witnesses. Yes, sir. No further witnesses? None, Jeff. State? Any rebuttal? No, Your Honor. like to make argument? How, how could I imagine? You would. Never me. You can go first. I'll let Thanks. you start the proceeding. Your Honor, um, the state's exhibits that were put into uh, evidence, specifically the orders by the court, they didn't direct Brad Kramer or Charlie Moon to do anything. They directed Jane Knoll to do what needed to be done all weapons out of that house, out of his property, except one shotgun. The court was abundantly clear. It was a court order. It was recited in a number of documents, order on initial hearing, and then an order directing the transport and retention of certain firearms. Designee, surrender all firearms. He was the one subject to the court order. 
Not Kramer, not Moon, not anybody else. Him. The initial hearing was in November. The search warrant for Tom James was March 13th. 125 days, and the evidence today was that he was living there. So for 125 days, he's in and out of that house. And so when he's in and out of that house, not once did he look around and say, I wonder if Brad Craven got all the guns. I wonder if Charlie Moon got all the guns. For 125 days, he could have picked up the phone, called his lawyer, picked up the phone, called it, called community corrections, called the court and said, hey, I've got two guns here. They missed them. I don't want to get in trouble. This guy is a law enforcement officer for 20-some years with the state police, two terms as the sheriff. He knows what a court order is, and the responsibility is on him and no one else. The evidence was, was rather clear. The shotgun was right by these weapons. His clothing was there. He directed him to there. He directed him to the bedroom where the Tom James clothing was. Did he forget? It doesn't matter if this gun was brand new, five years old, an antique gun. The court did not specify in its order that the gun had to be in good operating order. The gun had to be loaded. The gun had to be unloaded. The gun had to be in his bedroom. The gun had to be in his dresser drawer by his bed. None of those things happened. It was his responsibility, and the court, again, made it clear that that's what he was responsible for and no one else. The defense wants to talk about the issue of didn't they look at these boxes back in August? Didn't they see these Smith & Wesson boxes? And it really doesn't matter. These firearms were not subject to a search warrant and maybe they did open up the boxes and they see two firearms in it. The detective's going to say, put them back. Who cares? It doesn't matter because they were not subject. He was in lawful possession of those firearms at that time, not until the court issued its order in November did it become a violation of the court order and subject to contempt possibilities. The court filed this sua sponte. The court filed a rule to show cause based on a warrant return by Detective Heron. He's been entitled to due process. That's what this hearing is for. He's had his due process. He's had his chance to say, this is why I shouldn't be held in contempt. That's not happening. Willful, intentional disobedience of a court order. That, that's what's happened here. Not an oversight, not an overlooking. Maybe, maybe there was an oversight on Brad Kramer. So what? It doesn't matter. The responsibility bears on him and him alone, and uh, the accountability bears on him and him alone. So I'd ask the, uh, the court to find him in indirect contempt for the violation of the court's order, but the burden has been met, and the state would ask the court to, uh, to choose how best to deal with the uh, violation and the, uh, the contempt. Thank you, Mr. Hurdle. Please Mr. Lord, are you, you from the team that's going to argue? Yes, sir. Proceed. Thank you. Judge, I think it, Mr. Hurdle says it doesn't matter, but it does matter. Uh, willful intent to violate a court order uh, is exactly what it means. A willful activity on his part to violate the court order. As I recall that when Mr. Uh, Noel was incarcerated, and before the court permitted him to be out on bond, he would have had to assure this court that all weapons were out of the house except for a shotgun. So he wasn't free to go to his house and go through all of those weapons. And so he did what, under those circumstances, would be a reasonable, ask people who, one of whom was in law enforcement, one of whom was a gentleman that Mr. Moon, who Mr. 
Kramer did not know, but they volunteered to go out and assist Mr. Knoll in his responsibilities to this court in getting all those weapons. And they did that. Uh, and all those weapons were turned over to the state police. Now we know that in August, the state police had the photograph of the exact box in question in this case. Uh, and Mr. Hurdle may be right that they went through and they noticed, but nobody at least made note because the weapons apparently weren't of any interest to anybody until after Mr. Knoll was being arrested and required to turn them into the court. But if the state police knew that those weapons were in the house, they could have said, wait a minute, I think that theirs were missed because we're counting all the weapons and those Smith and Wessons were in that box downstairs when we're looking for documents weren't there. Do people make mistakes? Of course they do. But we know that those guns have been purchased since 2017 and they're in the same box, haven't been disturbed, haven't been out, haven't been touched, or at least no indication that they have by the state police themselves. We know that the court permitted him to have a shotgun, brand new, sitting in the basement. This does not rise itself, in my mind, to a fact that this is a willful contempt of this court order. I think that it was an inadvertent. Would I have done it differently? May very well have done it. I may have had someone else that I thought would be better, an independent person, to go to the house to make those choices about what was there and what wasn't there. Obviously, it's a room that doesn't get much attention because everything in the room was packed as if nobody has been in that room for quite some time. So I think that the argument that we're making would be that this is not a willful attempt of Mr. Knoll to violate this court order. Was it inadvertent? Yes. Did he apologize for having those weapons there when he thought all of the weapons in the house had been accounted for except the one that this court permitted him to have? I don't believe, Your Honor, this has risen to a level of contempt of this court order. And we would respectfully ask the court to not find so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boyle. Anything else from the state? No, Your Honor. <clears throat> Determination whether the alleged contemptuous act was committed with the intent to show disrespect or defiance as a factual matter to be determined by the court. Our Supreme Court has held that the respondent, Mr. Knoll, has the burden of establishing that his failure to obey the order was not willful. I told Mr. Knoll, don't do anything stupid. Do not try to deceive me, defy me. You will not like the consequences. Today is that day. You are not the law. You don't interpret the law. You don't enforce the law. You're not above the law. I find that you have, that you are in contempt of this court. Take him into custody. No, no, no. no that's enough. Yeah. I'll find you guys in, dis in contempt for disrupting the proceedings, and you'll be there right there with him. Now, what is an appropriate sanction? The question is, I can sentence him up to 180 days without a trial, or I can sentence him to a day, or I can release him. You know what I think the answer is? 60 days in. That's what I think it is, the answer is today. Now, Mr. Wilder. Yes, Your Honor. Or Mr. Boyles, I apologize, Mr. Boyles, your lead. Before he is released, I 
I'll take your suggestion. I want an independent individual to scour that household to determine that there's no further weapons. I find it, Mr. Hurdle's original argument that he's trying to make that I sustain, an officer, an officer of the law, every time I go into court, I hear, I didn't know it was there, I didn't know it was there, I really didn't. You've heard that a million times. You've heard it a million times, and yet you still take them into custody, would be my guess. Every officer in the world has heard, I didn't know it was there, it's my friends. I'm not buying it. It was your burden, it's your responsibility, and today the court will enforce that. Take them away. Anything else, Mr. Hurdle? Nothing to Mr. Boyles? No, we'll be your approach. You may. So the 60 days in, Sheriff got 60 days in. He'll probably appeal it, but I mean, he was found guilty for good reason. Now, this is the same sheriff that sent a SWAT team through my door, and I sure as heck didn't get the due process that he got. Uh, matter of fact, they were threatening to blow things up just to go through every inch of everything in my house. So I do not feel bad for Jamie Knoll. I think this is long overdue. I think what happened in court today no, underscores the seriousness of not following a court order. And I think what Judge Medlock did, said, and ordered spoke volumes. And that speaks the loudest. And I don't think that uh, I have more to say about that because I think he said it all. My clarifying was just going to be, from, from today, Jamie will be in custody for 60 days, and then he will have a, a maybe possibly new bond conditions or revert to the same bond conditions? Um, the same bond conditions will apply at this point in time, uh, but he'll do the 60 days and, uh, and come out with the same conditions. And would you say it's both parties' understanding that a trial date will be longer than 60 days from today? Uh, the trial date that we have is for the... Uh, substance of the case and that's uh, still being worked out at this point in time when the trial date is. I know the judge is trying to work with uh, both parties to try and come up with a date because it, uh, it takes a significant amount of time and uh, their schedules depend on each other along with Clark County and the judge from Washington County. The house can be searched again for any weapons? Uh, the judge indicated that there would be another uh, once over the uh, homes and what he has access to. And who will be conducting the search? Um, I don't know. And will, will Mr. Noel be housed at Scott County? Uh, that hasn't been determined yet, but I don't think it will be clear. So your name and your title? Uh, My name is Rick Hurl, R-I-C-H-E-R-T-E-L. Uh, I'm appointed special prosecutor. I'm originally from the practice of Rick Hurl. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Hurl. All right, so it hasn't always been justice uh, for everybody here at the Clark County Courthouse. But today, there was justice for everybody here at the Clark County Courthouse. So until next time, guys, we love you. See you on the next one. One.